Hi, everyone. And this does not work. Maybe it does, just a second. Yep. OK, so ID story, or rather ID support for Rust is something very, really, surely something to be excited about. And by the end of this talk, I expect everyone to know what it is, how do you use it, and how it currently works. So the plan for this talk is to first talk about the architecture of the Rust language server, which currently is the officially kind of supported way, the way to have your IDE features and for your favorite editor of choice. Then I plan to demonstrate very quickly how such features work. Uh, then I'll talk about how Cargo coordinates builds and why the RLS should bother. And finally, I'll talk about supporting Cargo workspaces and the RLS itself. So without further ado, let us begin. So first, the architecture. So as the name suggests, Rust language server is actually a language smartness server. As in, it's not a monolithic IDE, let's say. The compiler is not embedded in the IDE itself, but rather it serves to be a sort of a standalone server with which different IDs or text editors can communicate with. And they communicate with it via a custom interprocess protocol called the LSP. And the LSP has been developed by Microsoft. It's, the full name is Language Server Protocol. And so it aims to abstract away all, of, it aims to be as language agnostic as possible, as in it does not even try to define any semantics of a language. So for example, it does not know what a, let's say, class or interface or structure is. It mostly deals with text buffers and texts. And the most abstract thing to define, let's say, a symbol for a language as a symbol or a reference. And that's it. And that's it. Uh, so why even start using LSP? Why not just create another ID, such as Visual Studio? Uh, for M languages and N editors, we can see that we get M times N different implementations for different language supports in different editors. And by being as language agnostic as possible and by abstracting away the, all the protocol and the communication, we only need to implement only a single client for each editor and only a single LSP server for each language we want to support. And in this example, if let's say we use LSP compliant client in let's say Vim that can talk to let's say Rust language server, which aims to support Rust, we can see that they can interop very easily. So with this, the number of implementations goes down to well M plus N only. So this is very convenient. So what may be the responsibilities of a set server? Well, first of all, it has to coordinate and schedule different analysis builds. So let's say a user starts typing or modifying a file. Uh, the RLS shouldn't really try to, let's say, run cargo check or run cargo build with every keystroke. That's not optimal, to say the least. So it has to coordinate that. It also has to manage all the analysis data that, um, let's say, it's a small database that contains all the references to the symbols and whatnot. So it has to know how to answer all the, let's say, final references requests accordingly. And lastly, well, it's a LSP server, so it has to respond using the LSP queries. Respond to LSP queries. So uh, it actually aims to reuse all the existing tools. And it's probably a bad idea to just try and re-implement all of the ID functionality again inside a different tool while we have all these awesome tools that are existent and supported in the Rust ecosystem. So for example, when you want to format your document, you can use Rust format for that. Or when you want to analyze project structure, you can use Cardgo, the library, auto completion, racer, et cetera, et cetera. So in this regard, RLS actually aims to serve as a single point of entry for all the ID features you might want. And you can get it now easily. I assume almost everyone has Rust up installed. So the only thing you need to do is to run Rust up component at RLS. And if you have LSP compliant extension, let's say, and an editor, you're good to go. There are also like different extensions that are more 
Rust and RLS oriented, as in you can click your way, you click your way through and they will install Rust up for you, the appropriate tool chain and the component itself. So right now for Visual Studio Code, the officially supported one is Rust RLS, and from last time I checked, you get the same functionality installing the ID Rust package for Atom. Okay, so the capabilities, and I'm going to demo that using Visual Studio Code because it's mostly supported. I mean, you could probably get the most support from the RLS right now. And I recorded videos because I don't want to do live cutting because there are a lot of new, entire new dimension for screw-ups with that. So let's see if, if it works. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about diagnostics. And it's probably very easily overlooked, but it's the simple but the most essential feature, as in it's probably the embodiment of the edit and cargo check cycle you most probably find yourselves in. So when you edit your code, uh, you want to run cargo check to see if you have any errors or warnings. Then you fix them, edit the code again, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very handy for the errors that are Rust C generated to be displayed in line. And let's see if it's going to work out. OK, so we can see that there are error squiggles for this, and the error comes from Rust C compiler. We can double check using cargo check and see that's, nope. This is hard. OK, <laughs> you can believe me that the errors are the same for the Rust C and the, the one that was displayed in the IDE itself. So the next functionality that LSP also offers is hover. So let's say you have your definition, let's say a structure or a function, and it has an associated documentation with it, the doc comments. Uh, these are also served uh, by the LSP and the RLS itself. So when you hover over the function, let's say, you also get in a tooltip the documentation in Markdown. So that's really convenient. Also, you can see for a given identifier, what type is it? So you can see that, for example, it's a function that takes these arguments, return that, and it's very convenient, let's say, when you uh, manipulate your data using some mapping, et cetera. So that's convenient to see the type of a given identifier. So as you can see, we are served also the documentation for it. And it's the same as the one that's declared above. Next thing we have go to definition. So it's also very convenient to be able to jump to where a given structure or function is defined. Most importantly, to see, for example, how a structure is defined, what are the members. Possibly there's also an in block nearby, or in which context the given function is defined. And this also allows us to strengthen the kind of mental connections, the mental model of our project that we work on. So this is pretty straightforward. We have mix, we issue go to definition, and we automatically jump to a module containing that definition. Also, we have find references. This is also handy to realize what may be the interdependencies between modules. So let's say we work on another module, and we want to see in which other modules or parts of the code base the symbols are pulled in and used. So it's also a very convenient thing to have. For example, we can do that on the same example here. And we were presented with two files and where a given symbol is defined or reference. And last but not least, I think one of the most definitive features of ID is code completion. So I think it opens up an entire new dimension of learning, which is learning by experimentation. Not only do you need to read through all the documentation of a project or a language, although it is very much recommended to do that first, uh, but it, it's basically your assistant that helps you while you code, and you can see which symbols are valid inside a given context. 
So this is a very simple example. As I said, we are served, this is powered by the racer, and we are served the suggestions for all the symbols that were defined locally in this, in this context. And for example, after we type dot, and after the structure, we are served the data members and the functions that are valid for that structure. And we can check that these are in fact uh, the ones that, well, that are valid, and we can double check that these suggestions are in fact valid and they work. And the program compiles and works. Okay, so with the demo out of the way, let's talk about how Cargo coordinates builds. But first of all, it's to talk about the RLS, not Cargo, so why should RLS bother? Well, first of all, as I said, it leverages all the existing tools, which is Cargo also. It uses it to analyze the project structure and schedule a build. And it's good to know about that, so we can reuse all the results to cache it and then reduce the latency for the user. So the user doesn't have to wait three seconds, he can right now wait two and a half. That's an improvement. <laughs> Okay, so very simply, I'm going to talk about from the RLS point of view what Cargo does, and even then I'm going to simplify a little bit to extract the gist of it. So what Cargo does is it looks at the declared package dependencies with using similar constraints. So let's say we can declare our dependency saying, okay, I need exactly version 1.2.0 for a given dependency or any other compatible with it. So with this information, with these dependency constraints, we get a constraint graph, dependency graph. So what we do later is we resolve the constraints to actually specified packages that are the resulting data structure is a dependency directed acyclograph between packages. And let's delve deeper what it means and what it is. So let's Take an example, WebRender, which consists of three packages, Wrench, WebRender, and WebRender API. So the graph has to be between packages, at least at this point. It has to be directed because dependency is very directed in its nature, as in when a package A depends on B, the, the B does not depend back on A, it's only one way. And it also has to be a cyclic because it's necessary to be able to know where to start when we want to issue a build. So we can have cycles because if for in this example we want to build wrench, then we have to build API first, but it all depends on each other and we can do it. So the graph has to be a cyclic. And these properties actually guarantee that we can achieve a topological sorting of a graph. So topological sorting, what it is, is simply put from a build system point of view, the order, the linear order of a graph of how, in which order can the packages be compiled. So at no point of time, we are compiling a package for which its dependencies were not built before, basically. So in this example, we can pick WebRender API first because it does not depend on anything else, then WebRender, and then we can't build wrench yet, we have to build 30 before, and after that, as you can see, the numbers create the linear ordering of a given graph. And there's no only one ordering for a given graph. Most often there are many, but I guess you can pick one. And then when we have that, we need to transform it into a dependency DAG between package targets. So we have to go lever down, let's say, more fine-grained, on a more fine-grained level. So what package target is, is that package can have multiple targets. So let's say a binary target, a library target, and a build script target. And the way it works is that it creates an implicit dependency between those. As in, we have to first build and compile the build script to, let's say, prepare the environment for which the rest of the package can be built. And then since the library hosts most of the implementation and the API and all not, it has to be built first before we build binary that uses it. So equipped with that knowledge, we can very easily transform the dependency graph between packages into dependency graph between package targets. And there's also a small caveat here that when a package depends on another one, 
it implicitly depends on its library package target. And this transformation retains all the properties, as in the graph can also be topologically sorted and used to schedule a build. So we can sort that, as I said, then we get the ordering of package targets. And how this is very convenient is that this almost maps one to one to appropriate RUSC invocations. So after we do that, the only thing Cargo still has to do is to schedule and spawn RUSC process and processes, fetch the data, coordinate it, et cetera. OK, so with this out of the way, let's talk about supporting Cargo workspaces. But first of all, what's a workspace? So let's take a look what Cargo new creates by default. So by default, it creates a single package project. So there's a cargo.log file with all the resolved dependencies, which is basically the resolved dependency graph that I told you about, and the target directory for the build artifacts that are created during the build. And obviously, also, there is an actual package with its manifest file, cargo.toml. So how workspaces differ from the single package project is that we still have the same log file and the target directory, but now the main package is optional, and we can explicitly specify all the member packages inside a project, so it can host multiple packages. So how the RLS operated up, on the, up until this point is that it supported only a single package target, which is quite limiting, as you can guess, because even a single package can contain binary and library. So even if you want to work on your library, you only get the diagnostics, the warnings, and the ID features only for the library. But as is most, um, most often the case, the package is split into binary and library, and library hosts almost all of the implementation, and binary is uh, mostly a thin wrapper around that. So when we switch to actually supporting bin, we lose all the ID features for the lib, which is the most part of the program. So it's very limiting at this point. So how it, did, how it works in this mode is that it runs cargo procedure first when analyzing a project, and it stores the final compiler invocation that cargo issued. And you can configure it right now with rust.build underscore bin and rust.build underscore lib options. Obviously, any LSP supporting client that supports the configuration API will do. But right now, I think only the Rust extension for the VS Code does. So let's see how that works, and that we get the split between binary and library. So we have diagnostics only for library here. As you can see, this is a simple package that is split into a lib and bin. So we change the configuration to analyze the binary. And as we can see, it flipped to, for the diagnostics for the binary. So we lost all the information and the, and the diagnostics for the library. And the newly implemented mode, which is still experimental, and your mileage may vary, is the workspace mode. So how does that differ from the previous one is that I told you the previous one only caches the last invocation, while in the workspace mode, we teach RLS about the interdependencies between package targets and thus between packages. So we are able to fetch all the diagnostics data for each target and in result for each package. And because it's still unstable, you need to enable its feature, it's behind a feature gate called unstable features, so you need to enable both the unstable features and the workspace mode. So let's see how this implementation actually helped for a uh, single package that is split into lib and bin. So as previously, we only have diagnostics for the binary. So when we toggle the option, we can see that we are fed the diagnostics for both package targets, which is good. And with this, let's see how it actually helped, how the workspace mode helped for supporting actual workspaces. So this is a simple workspace. It has two member packages, literally called first and second. The first one depends on the second one. 
as you can see in the manifest file. And the code obviously should not compile, but we are not fed any diagnostics and we can't use any features for it. So let's try flipping the, the switch to on for the workspace mode. And since, in, since, since it's unstable, sometimes it's best to just reload it and restart it with the workspace mode on. And we need to wait a bit, and here we go. We are served diagnostics, and we also get the auto-completion inside a workspace. Okay, so simply, how does it work? How, the, how is the workspace mode implemented, and how does it differ? Well, first of all, we need to cache the structure that is used by Cargo, that Cargo generates between package targets. And when we have that, we can then easily map the dirty packages, sort the result, and get the appropriate compiler invocations that the RLS can actually execute and fetch the data and analysis from. So first, as I said, we use a heuristic. We map dirty files since last successful analysis built uh, for appropriate package targets inside a graph. So in this example, we modify the library of WebRender. Then when we modify in quick succession, let's say, build script of wrench, we also mark that, mark that. And then after the build is scheduled and actually executed, we have to perform another step, which is mark all the transitive dependencies. Because in this case, when we, let's say, when we have analysis data, we modify the build script, we still have to recompile and fetch results from the binary, which depends on it, because it might be invalidated by the recompilation of the build script. So when we have that, when we have that graph, we can then easily topologically sort it again. We get the same ordering we had when, with what Cargo did previously. We use the cached compiler invocations, which we captured during running Cargo build procedure. And then we actually have to run in-process compiler. So how does that? How does that differ from what Cargo does? Is that Cargo spawns new processes for each compiler invocation. And this actually won't do for the RLS case because there's a significant overhead for when we want to emit the safe analysis data, which is a, a, as a JSON blob, to the disk only to be read later. So we're talking about megs of text data that is only written to disk without any purpose. So we pass that in memory. But there is a small caveat here also. We have to take care of all the environment variables that are set for, by cargo for each package. So when we actually do that, we run it linearly. We coordinate the environment for each package. We collect the results. And then it actually works inside a bigger workspace. OK, so that's how supporting workspaces work. And that's how Rust language server fares right now. Thank you. <laughs> so if you have any questions, I guess it would be better to just catch me and ask me directly. I hope you have many questions. So we have time. Oh, no, you don't want to have questions? <laughs> yes. I mean, sure. No, we have this, uh, no. how many minutes we have? No, two questions. Okay, sure. We can do that also. Two questions. And over here and next one over there. So at the start you said that uh, with the RLS and the LSP you don't need n times n plugins. Mm -hmm. You only need like n plus n. Mm -hmm. But then you said you should install the VS Code RLS plugin. How, like, how big is the Rust-specific plugin for uh, Virtual Studio? Is it just oh. a small shim to like, set the thing up, or is there actually a lot of code in it? No, so actually Microsoft developed the standard, because the, the LSP actually is developed by Microsoft. They also developed VS Code. So it was actually very handy and convenient for them to implement a generic LSP client first, and they expose it as a library. 
So how the Rust extension works is that it loads a bulk of the LSP, it uploads all the LSP responsibilities to the library that's created by Microsoft, and I think the Rust specific parts are like 5%, 10% of the overall si size of the extension, I guess. So not, not much. It mostly handles configuration in a custom way. And also installs the Rust up toolchain and component and whatnot, so it's helpful. All right, another question over here. Yeah. So my question is, you mentioned that you use uh, Rusty and Cargo itself already, but it sounds like you do a lot of the um, tasks that would be the job of those things instead in RLS itself, uh, specifically the um, compilation, ordering, um, and stuff like that. So is that something you do in RLS or uh, is that something that uh, Rusty does? Uh, which exact part, if you can repeat? Like, why do we afford okay, most uh, of the let me, work Let me simplify Cargo? the question, sorry. Uh, the stuff that you talked about today, it sounds like you do a lot of that yourself in RLS, mm -hmm. uh, but it sounds, to me, it sounds like that's a job for Rusty. So how much do you do that yourself, and how much of that is delegated to Rusty? Um, I'm not exactly sure how much Rusty does. I mean, it, can, it is capable of creating all the DEP info for the packages themselves. But right now, we use the heuristic for mapping the dirty files to, uh, that if, is that what you're asking, more or less? Yeah, yes. OK, yes. OK. So right now, we use the heuristic, as I said. But probably, we can just switch to mark exactly, to use to consume the DEP info files that Rusty emit, emits. So, but right now, we don't do it yet. All right, thank you, Igor. Hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>